What a pleasure it is to be back in Dunedin in Otago for the Otago Classic Rally. This event has so many names. It's the International, International Four Wheel Drive, International Classic. It doesn't matter. These boys are here for one reason, one reason only. Chris Meek, Brandon Semenuk. Great to see you boys here. Tell us, how long have you been here, Chris? Uh, what, 48 hours now? I probably slept three of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a bit upside down with a jet lag. Now I feel what Hayden Padden felt like coming to every WRC rally. I can understand it, but it is about as far away as you can get from Europe. But uh, no, I've enjoyed it so far. We managed to get out on a test this morning. I had a drive in the car and uh, you really Falls enjoyed it. on the car. I mean, that's what is the car like? Honestly, it was really enjoyable. You, as you know, I've done a little bit of Mark to Escorts over the last 68 months when we went to do the RAC. That didn't last as long as I would have liked with a, some engine trouble, but um, I've tested other Escorts since. And uh, yeah, it was a nice call to get to come here to Otago. There's been some rallying royalty in that car over the years. With well, Vatnen, Kankinen, Waldegard, Mouton, Mouton, McRae's, Oriel, McRae's, Mega Irvinen, Matt Salzburg. So delighted to get the call and was intrigued to see what the car was like and was really impressed this morning. And honestly, okay, here the regulations are a bit different. You're allowed power assisted steering, which in an escort makes a big difference. Plus, they're a bit more open on the suspension. You can have a bit different dampers, a bit meteor dampers, a bit more oil in them. So. It, uh, yeah, it felt really, really good this morning. I enjoyed it, so let's see. Brandon, you've been here a, a little bit longer? Yeah, we, uh, we came in a bit early. Me and Keaton uh, went, went into Queenstown, which is kind of a, you know, a uh, main stopping point in New Zealand for me. Like, obviously, the mountain bike scene there is really big, and I got a lot of friends in that area. So we, we got there Friday, and, and I got to hang out and ride for three, four days, and Catch up, catch up with some people I don't get to see very often. Obviously, last time I've been in New Zealand was like, I mean, four years ago, pre-COVID. So, um, yeah, it was, it was great to stop in, and I'm doing probably a little better than Chris, feeling well acclimated at this point. And, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's nice to be in Dunedin. We've, we've actually done some mountain biking and some filming here as well. So I'm familiar with the area uh, and, and, and this rally, but to actually be here competing at the rally is, is you know, Cool. It's finally be here. How is the, the the time difference for you? Because for us, it's well, I mean, for you're in Andorra so now. I'm Andorra, it's a Central European name. I think it's ten hours. Yeah. Ten hours difference. Eleven for me. Savage. Uh, for me, it's like four hours. Oh, really? A walk in the park. We were here during time change, so it might be like five or three. I can't remember which way we've gone, but um, yeah, it's like four hours. So I'm maybe maybe waking up a bit earlier than I normally do and going to bed a bit earlier, but it's like I don't. It was so easy to adjust. Yeah. And the car, did you get a run in your car? You're in the Subaru Impressor, the H6. Explain a little bit about the car and what it was like. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't know too much about the car before we got here. I, I kind of understood what the build was. It's, it's kind of like a group end concept. Uh, but with this H6 engine, it, you know, naturally aspirated V6, I've never got to experience. So that was, that was definitely really unique and, and uh, cool to drive. Uh, it's different than I thought like it, it it does have like a little bit of low end power because of the you know the power is always there naturally aspirated but it was kind of like it also had like a peakiness to it so if you'd like you revved it way higher than I thought you would uh just I don't know naturally I thought you would be kind of one of those torquey lower lower rev engines um but yeah it was it's was, it a cool car it definitely takes me back to my early beginnings of just you know raw older Subaru chassis Group N spec, just, you know, minimal adjustment suspension. And, and it's like there's nothing crazy about the car, but it's so simple that it's just like all you do is get in and drive the thing. Like you don't need to think about much. Your car, the, the question I wanted to ask, there is the, the names that we've talked about. Does that, does it bring a bit more kind of pressure that, you know, that everybody's been in it? Yeah, um, I feel a bit strange being in that company of the, the Kankinens and the Voldegards and stuff, but... Uh, yeah, just honestly, just to get the chance to drive the cars uh, is nice, and you know the the hospitality here is incredible. But it's the roads that drew me here. You know, I I never got the chance to do Rally New Zealand as a round of the World Championship. I was never in the series. It stopped in 2012, I think, uh, and I come on the scene with Citroen in late 2013, and then I finished in 2019, and I'd arrived back in 2021. So. Um, I missed the opportunity to drive here. Um, 
even though the roads in the north, I think, are a little bit more technical than in the south here in Otago. From what I'm told, it's very, very fast and high speed, and, but still got that lovely undulating terrain. And, uh, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, and that's what that's what really drew me here. It was always my bucket list to drive a rally car in New Zealand. So we'll, uh, what better than a Mark II? Absolutely. And you, but you haven't been in the UAE 21 years ago. and two I think it was 2003. It was the first event for the Zero Three Focus. And I was working at M Sport at that time as an engineer. And I had a handout with uh, Christian Lorio designing that car. And... Uh, Okay, I didn't have much design input. I was a CAD jockey on the 3D CAD system. And, but uh, that was a big project and probably the first major project I was involved in as an engineer back then. So I was really intrigued to see how the car, there was a big anticipation at that time to see because Loeb was dominating in the Zara. Yeah. And so myself, Glenn Patterson, and my brother flew out and we watched Rally New Zealand and then came down to the South Island for a week's holiday after it. But I remember we are even standing at the junction where... Marco Martin was leading the rally. The car was amazing. It retired about a kilometre up the road from a junction we were standing at with an engine failure. Yeah. We ran up the road to where he stopped and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I remember that. So that was my only experience in New Zealand. At that time, I was only starting out doing rallies at that time. And uh, we did do the recce, not the recce as such. We drove all the stages up in the North yeah. Island. So, But, yeah, really intrigued to see what the roads are like down here. But I know it will be amazing. It's just... On a scale of one to ten, how amazing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, we, Colin and I have been down well, last year. Colin's been a couple of years more, but it is. And like you said, hospitality is great. It's a beautiful part of the world. But also, what kind of intrigues me is you two. You you haven't met before, but you know you're both absolute megastars in in your own worlds, and you perhaps in in two worlds. But what's it like? You know, I remember back in the day when McRae met Travis and Ken for the first time, and it was just a kind of a an immediate kind of bond because you are different to the rest of us in the stuff that you do. What's it like to sort of meet each other? You met for the first time this morning. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, I, I didn't know if Chris was familiar with me, but I was very familiar with, with Chris and his driving and, I, you know, big fan over the years. Um, but I, I, it, the more and more that, like, I come to new places and, and experience more motorsport and, and groups and cultures within it, the more I, I see like this mountain bike and motorsports like clash, like it's, it just seems to kind of go hand in hand. Like a lot of motorsport drivers ride mountain bikes or, or, or road ride or whatnot. And, and then mountain bikers are very like, like rally is like that's mountain biking on steroids. So it's, there's just this kind of weird crossover, even there, like the, the worlds are so separate, but I feel like uh, there's that common connection between the two and, and respect obviously. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I, I've seen it before. I have, I competed with Nicola Vios yeah, yeah. in the Peugeot Super 2000 back in my IRC days, and he was really rapid. He actually got a factory seat with Peugeot on a couple of rallies. Um, and I know Nico well, and I think, as, as Bratton says, there's something about mountain bike, something about mountain biking where you're having to read the grip. You never know a stone could be out of place, it could be a stone upturned. You're trying to read the grip. It's high speed between the trees. There's so many similarities. Obviously, it's a bike and a car, but I've seen it before where guys from the mountain bike world, you know, they excel in rallying, you know, and it's not even their first sport. Like, Bradley's probably a late starter. I don't know, what what age did you start rallying? Uh, I mean, I started when I was, like, 18 or 19. Huh. So not, like, super late, but I wasn't, I didn't, like, immerse myself in it because I, I had yeah. another career. I mean, I, st like, I still do, but it was, yeah. like, at that point, I didn't, I didn't have, you know, whatever little bit of extra funds I had that was getting put into rally, but it would be, like, one or two events a year for the yeah. first few years. I wasn't, like, always in the car and just being, like, you know, getting the experience fast. It was kind of, like, a slow burn, and then... Yeah. I did get to a point where it was like, then I was finally doing like a whole championship and I'd get to do seven or eight events a year. And, and that's where I felt like my progression went. Yeah, you uh, need to be doing lots of rallies. Yeah. But no, it's impressive. Um, what Bradham's doing in, in the US championship is is incredible, you know. Um, I think you can even see now on the on the last couple of events I watched, you know, Travis has come back and he's he's been struggling a bit. But I think Bradham's at that age where he just keeps progressing all the time, you know, so... Um, but no, it's 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 quite clear. Mountain bike guys definitely have something. I certainly don't have 
the skill on a mountain bike that he has in a rally car. It doesn't work vice versa. I enjoy mountain biking and I enjoy going downhill, but uh, I some of the World Cup downhill tracks in Andorra, I have to put the bike over my shoulder and carry it down. I have to say, I have to confess that. It, it was interesting, you know, Chris, you were just talking earlier. You and I have talked a lot about bikes, about road racing at home, TT and what have you. And one thing that really intrigued me, that you said, you know, there's TT and there's mountain bike downhill that are on a par of insanity almost, isn't it? And you do, you live in Andorra, so you've, you've ridden some of the downhill tracks. Yeah, um, I'm lucky enough to live there. I live on the same face of the mountain that the World Cup downhill track is on. So it's the World Cup downhill track used to pass within 200 metres of my house. So. But... When the show comes to town for the World Cup downhill in Andorra, tens of thousands of spectators, you see the best guys in the world. And I've actually been lucky enough because a lot of the top guys, Loic, Brunei, uh, Greg Minnar, they all live in Andorra. And uh, I'm lucky enough to be good friends with them. But to watch the World Cup circus come to town and what those guys do between the trees is insane, you know. Um, and like I said, for me, Isle of Man TT on a motorbike is the biggest sport in the world that I have respect for is a guy's putting their everything on the line between the trees next is what these guys do on a, on a mountain bike because they don't have the protection you don't have a roll cage and the speeds and the jumps they're doing between trees is frightening yes we do it in a rally car but you have a, a bit of a get out card which works 99.9% of the time as a roll cage you know but uh, these guys don't and that's the difference eh? I think I mean there is you look at suspension technology on mountain bikes i mean it's come on such a long way okay it's still a long way behind cars but there is that sort of parallel isn't it between the, the tech yeah i mean at, at mountain bike technology you know bikes and equipment in the last i mean i keep saying five years it's probably been 10 years now but it, it's like the the rate that it's improving is is so wild like the suspension has really come a long way and that that is a big aspect as well as you know you know, there's been this change in wheel sizes, but with that, it's really like the geometry and the kinematics of the bikes have this like improved so much to where eh, it's unbelievable. Like you can carry so much more speed and like the terrain could be so much rougher. And, and it's just like being a rider, it's like, it's a lot less effort than it used to be. The, the bikes you were, you know, similar to kind of like these early age cars we're driving, like it just, they it's work funny. like it's you funny. can make them work but they're not like they're, there's no relaxing in the car or the bike you know it's funny you mention that because now they run like a 29 front and a yeah. 27 and a half yeah rear. the mullet isn't it yeah exactly that would be like a mullet setup. you could go full 29 but it like when yeah. I started it was 26 inch wheels well my old bike that I got off specialized back in the day was the demo 8 was a 26 26 yep. and then I rented one day a mullet bike with bigger front wheel and it just was so different really and i end up selling my my specialized bike and that much of a difference yeah i even i felt the difference i know nothing about bikes yeah. but if you're yeah. if you're riding in andorra and you've got like you know that the the train's quite quite gnarly it's like yeah. quite rough and like the bigger wheel just rolls over everything but what comes with that is the speed like the bike is this because it's rolling over everything you just gain speed everywhere so they're yeah and then to take it back to world cup downhill like the speed those boys are going, boys and girls, uh, is just like it's mind blowing. It's it's so much faster than it used to be. be it all, also because of the equipment and the suspension technology and like the it's almost like Formula One like preparation now. Yeah. Um, but like yeah, the bikes are unbelievable. Yeah. Have you have you done much downhill? I I grew up racing cross country and four cross, and I did a little bit of downhill, just like some fun stuff when I got to like the transition of like racing and then going into this like kind of free ride slope style direction. I, I'd kind of burnt myself on racing. I, I, and it sounds weird cause I was so young, but I had started when I was, I was really young. My brother was a professional cross country road racer. Um, he did a bunch of, you know, a bunch of stuff and a lot of international things. And so like from a young age, like I think like six years old, I started to kind of get into it. And then by nine, I was like doing like the whole, like, you know regional championship and then it was like national championship and and more like stuff outside the box but the age of nine yeah so like like six years in i'm like five or six years in i'm sort of like already getting burnt on it as like a, a kid and and then there was like there's so many other disciplines in mountain biking that i just never got to experience because 
time and any like if I needed a new bike it was always a race bike and then when I got like finally got like a jump bike or a downhill bike it was kind of like well it's like this opened up my world to like mm. all this other stuff I haven't really got to like dig into so by that time where I like had a downhill bike I could go race downhills I was already over racing I didn't want to do it anymore I was just like I'm gonna go over here and do this so you just go do backflips or 40 <laughs> foot gap jumps or something yeah Nine years old, Chris, is not a bad age to start. There's a certain nine-year-old me that's, that's yeah. competing and doing pretty well. Yeah, uh, my, my two young girls now are racing, skiing. They're only eight and nine years of age, but they've been skiing since they're three. So they're part of the race club in Andorra. Part of the school curriculum there in the wintertime is one day a week you have to be in the mountain. Then there are the race club Saturday and Sunday, and then a Wednesday night after school, they have slalom practice on their floodlight. So four days a week they're in the mountain. It's a great age, though, isn't it? You know, you're fearless. and you Yeah, know. so I cannot keep up with them now, honestly. I'm not a great skier, but I can't keep up, and she's nine years of age, and she's just won the Andorran School Championships. So, yeah, um, let's see where that goes. I know nothing about skiing, but I have my nine-year-old daughter coming home and tell me I put the wrong wax on the skis, <laughs> so I need a different, different type of wax for the different conditions. But anyway, it's, it's good for them, you know, good discipline. It, absolutely, it is, and... One thing I'd, I'd wanted to ask, Chris referenced it there, you know, the, the jumping off the cliffs and everything, Red Bull Rampage that you do. How, what's the feeling like when you're about to start that run at the top of the, the, the cliff? Does it compare with anything? The hairs in my hand are going up even thinking about it. It's nuts, isn't it? But it, is it, does it compare in any way to starting a stage, you know, maybe a really gnarly stage in, in Oregon There's some really tricky ones? Honestly, like Rampage is, it's, it's the lead up to me is like the stressful kind of like scary bit. I feel like when I'm at the top for like my run, you know, you're like within a few minutes of dropping, like I'm really nervous, but I'm not really scared at all. Really? And I, I like, I'm not really even thinking about anything. I'm kind of just like, it's like you almost just like zone out completely. And you're just kind of like, you have this like bit of anxious, nervous feeling of like, I just like, can I just go? Like, just like, I know I, I've prepared already. We've ridden everything, like we've done the build, done the whole thing. I just get get me down the hill is like basically the feeling. Um, in the rally car, maybe there's been the odd times or like like obviously like when when Ken and I had a, a serious battle going on in, in 22 at a few of the events where it was like it was like this is the stage that's going to determine things, and it was kind of like a checkers or wreckers situation. Uh, like you start the stage being like okay, like that bit of a feeling like. Let's just get into it. Yeah. Um, but, but not really scared, not really nervous so much. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's all preparation, right? Like you show up to the rally once you've done your pace notes, you've done your homework, and you get in the car, your helmet's on, you, just, you don't really think of anything else. You're just ready to go. It just resonates a bit. I remember Finland, Rally Finland. Point of Poya. On Poya, but not even on Poya. It's just going to the first stage Friday morning. You've done your test, you've done your recce, you've done all the work and all the talking and stuff before in the day leading up to it you just want that all out of the way you just want to get to the start line and go you know were, were you generally you never sca- I'm not sure if you're scared but would you be more anxious in Finland just because of the speed I don't, th- I don't think I've I was ever scared sitting on a start line of our stage I was never scared because you believe in what you can do but there's a level of anticipation that sort of bit of nervousness and for sure, events like Finland, it just sort of ratchets up that a little bit more because it's the Finnish Grand Prix is the most iconic rally in the world. And the speeds are incredible there, so you really have to be zoned in. So it is, there's a, just that heightened level of anxiety, but I wouldn't say scared, no. How you sit there, Chris Meek, and modestly talk about it, you're the winner of the fastest ever rally Finland, and you're the f- nobody has won a WRC round at a higher average speed than you. You're still the quickest man in WRC. I... Uh, yeah, it's it's true, but since I'd on the rally, the route has never been the same, and they put in these anti-cut devices. I have no doubt in the current Rally 1 cars, if they'd done the same route to the same road, they would eclipse the fastest speed, no question. So it's yes, it's a record, but um, I think the nature of the rally, trying to keep the average speeds down now, they've curtailed a bit the roads, so... But it's been quick Poland and, and, you know, Latvia will be quick this year. It's been Estonia. But so I see this year they're going back to do the 33K on Ampoya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. normal way or the reverse yeah, uh, way? Uh, not. So you'll come past the yellow house on the left. Okay, so the normal way. 
When I done it, it was the first time in 27 years that they ran it reverse. Yeah, so you do, the Yellow House was a sort of drop-off, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, but anyway. You, you have to come to Finland. Uh, it looks amazing. And I'm, I've watched on, on, on a Poya stage, like, yeah. a bunch of times. It is just, like, it, unbelievable. From what I've so watched good. a few onboards of here, Otago, and it's not that different. Uh, Finland's probably a bit more technical. A bit more sharper elevation. Yeah, but quite wide in places like Finland. Quite wide, but Finland can go into narrow roads, um, softer roads. Um, the newer versions of the rally seem to get more technical. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but within they cut off into the real narrow sections to bring the average speed yeah, down and yeah. stuff. But the, here, when I watch some of Hayden's on boards, which I wish I hadn't have done, because <laughs> it just looks insane. And he's so perfect lines everywhere he's done. He obviously knows the roads so well, but the... It was impressive to watch. But here is like a, a tamer Finland, but as fast and as challenging, but it just has not real technical jumps, big, massive jumps you do in Finland. But, yeah, the roads are quite similar here, but just everything's a little less aggressive. Just to whiz back momentarily to, to Rampage and, and the difference, but one thing, obviously, with, with competing and rallying, you've got a co-driver next to you telling you how difficult was it to... to remember everything when you were at Rampage because you you pick you pick out your route and everything and it, is that was that element of having a co-driver talking to you now is that quite different when you're used to just doing your own thing on a bike uh yeah I mean I think notes and co-driver and the whole the, all that was like like when I started rallying I was like it was hard to wrap my head around because it was just like if someone was yelling at me while I was riding my bike it would just throw me off like I wouldn't I would be like shut up go away you know but in a rally car now it's like it's like i can't get in the car it's weird when you don't have someone calling notes like it's it's, yeah. a, it's a weird sensation like even today like spin a couple laps it's me and keaton and then we do some media rides and you're like i don't remember the road at all until you get you set off you're like oh, i know what i'm doing but but it is a weird like how much you rely on the pace notes and 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 listening to to the co-driver it's uh it's strange but the rampage is different because we're we're covering so much less ground um and What's a run at Rampage? Um, it's like minutes? 45 seconds, so probably. 45 seconds. Maybe a minute, depending on like okay. how direct your line is or if you have like a, a traverse of any sort. Yeah. But, you know, there's, there's typically like maybe six to ten features in your run with some like kind of connecting trail. But you've, you've built it all yourself. You've been there nine days already. You're like, you, you know, I like the back of your hand. Like there'll be little rock stacks on the lip to just like show you exactly where to go and everything. So like it's yeah. like. You've kind of got your you have your recce your well recce's already p- yeah. placed, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it 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 is quite remarkable. But I, there's a, a, just a few questions that I I kind of prepared here. Chris, we'll start with you. Who was the, who's had the biggest influence on your career? I think it goes to that question. Everyone knows my association with Colin McRae back in the day. Um, Colin was my idol when I was a kid growing up. Um, funny we were chatting about the other day I remember I think it was was it Donegal rally or was it Circuit of Ireland rally was on the same time that Colin won his no his first ever rally in New Zealand it was first ever world rally 1993 that's right because Jimmy was at home because Alex- Jimmy was on the Circuit of Ireland and I was there in a chase car with my dad he was supporting Bertie Fisher and I remember coming off the end of a stage and everybody was cheering and dancing up the road because Colin had won Rally New Zealand. And that was 1993. So I was only 14 at that time. So, um, yeah. I never knew then that I would even drive a rally car. I never dreamed I would drive it in the World Championship, let alone win World Rallies. But it was only for one reason why Colin McRae chose to get behind my career when I was younger and he put the foundations in place for me to move from national championship into the world championship. And without that stepping stone and his, wouldn't say guide, his guidance, he, he never sat in a rally car with me and told me what to do, but he, he provided the footsteps and the financial backing for me to break through the world championship. So that's the hardest step of steps to take as a driver. And without that opportunity, I wouldn't have been where I've been and wouldn't have had the career I had. So I owe everything to Colin. And, you know, it's, it's, very straightforward for me to answer that question. Colin McRae certainly was the biggest influence in my career. You know? Bikes or cars, but top Colin McRae, if you can. <laughs> Hard to do, but uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'd have a hard time really pinpointing one person. Um, and I feel like there, there will continue to be people throughout, you know, this, this endeavor and journey in, in uh, motorsports that, that will help me out immensely. But I, it definitely started with, with Power Shard uh, early on, just through a, a familiar connection we had. Basically, I, I rolled into his shop. It was the first time I'd ever been in, like, a, a, a rally shop in my life. Motorsport shop, for that matter. And I was passionate about rally already. I, I watched it. I had a, you know, I bought a Subaru because I, I wanted to go rally, and it was fun in the, on the forestry roads near my house. And, but it wasn't a rally car. So I went in there. A buddy of mine's like, you, you should just go check out his shop. Meet Pat. You know, he's he's Canadian Subaru rally driver. And as I walked in, literally that day, he took my stock car and gave me a a race ready rally car so uh, they were, it, it needed some preparation but he's like he just took the keys and he's like he's like i'll hand you a, a brand new ready to go it was it's almost what i'm driving here in otago but it was is an o2 bug eye production spec like bone stock just had you know skid plates wheels tires some suspension uh but but get ready to race so i was like that was amazing and then so he built this car over like the matter of like six months and then in that time, uh, one of my really good friends, another professional mountain biker, lived right across from the chalet. And one of my sponsors, there's a, someone within the PR department that loved rally, loved motorsports. And it was Crankworks and it's, you know, big mountain bike festival. And he's like, he basically like pulled me away from practice. He's like, you got to come with me. He's like, we're, we're just, we're going to go over here for 20 minutes. And he took me to the chalet and I'm like, I know where I am. My buddy lives like right, right there. And they're like, yeah, but like this guy lives here. And I was like, yeah, yeah, here he's like into cars or something. And so he takes me upstairs and there's PD- PWC World Championship Trophy, a bunch of like uh, British National Rally Championship trophies. And I was like, it was, it was Martin Rowe. Yeah. And then whatever. Skid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so we, we got chatting and he was like so stoked that I was into rally. Gave me a bunch of like old in car from like British Rally Championship like in the McGann and stuff. And then uh, he's like, the day you get your car, he's like, we're going to go rally. I'm like, sure, you know, like not going not gonna to question that. And so the very first day I ever sat in a rally car was with Martin Rowe. And he's uh-huh. always been really helpful, like anything I've needed, any questions, and, and just kind of guiding me uh, the best he can. Or just, just he's just genuinely interested in, and wants to, you know, he's always wanted to see the best for me, I, I believe. So... That's been really cool. And then, I mean, to, to go another step further in that kind of a, uh, my rally endeavors is, uh, you know, when Pat kind of moved out of his seat in, in the Canadian Rally Championship, he brought in Antoine Lestage, who I was familiar with already. But with him there, and I was in within kind of Pat's team racing, Antoine had helped me a lot, and he still does. He's like, he, he hits me up every rally, and he's just always like, you know, really intuitive and curious how things are going. And he's come to some tests and things like that. So uh, another driver is just like, he's an amazing driver. He's, he's more like my style of driving where he's really meticulous and, and he likes to break down things on the road a lot. And um, so he's been, he's been awesome. And then, and then to go to the last step, you know, my journey so far has been Travis just really, uh, I, I, I feel like I wouldn't, with Subaru Motorsports USA if it wasn't for Travis he I, I think he was the one that that kind of pushed me through as like an option uh at the team uh and just you know from from like day one just being like a, an open book of like this is he's like he wanted me to get up to speed so that he had like competition and and he could improve himself like if he could learn something off me like where maybe I find some time on a stage and he's like hey now I know I can go faster there like that was like he was he was really clever in that. See, he is really clever in that sense of where like, if he leveled up his teammates' competition, it leveled up his competition, and then and then we could be like the dominant team. And yeah, I've seen Travis work when I done uh, races in Nitro, yeah. Nitro Rallycross. You know, I've been a fanboy of Travis all my life, and I met him a few times. He's you, your kind of guy, isn't he? Cool. But I really got to know him during the Nitro Rallycross. But like you say, for me, Travis is this aura and this cool thing around that he's a superstar you know who does his insane stuff tricks and motorbikes and the first ever guy to do a backflip or a hotel double backflip rooms. and jumps out airplanes with no parachutes but how meticulous he works behind the scenes 
and he's clever, clever, clever guy. So don't let the the Aurora fool you. The guy works really hard at it, and he he's a big inspiration of mine too. You know, but like Brandon says, when I went to the Nitro uh, Rallycross, he really done everything he could to help me out and anything I needed. You know, so yeah, he's uh, he was uh, an influence in my career a little bit as well. You know, did you know? Did you know Martin? Did you know yeah, I'd done my second ever rally. Martin Rowe was still competing in British Championship. The Rally of Wirral. Oh, yeah. In Foot Formula and Rally or whatever. It yeah, was. Uh, 2001. Foot and mouth disease was uh, first round of the Peugeot 106 Cup. And Martin Rowe was a factory Peugeot driver. Renault, Peugeot. Maybe he was Peugeot, then he was Renault. With Robbie Head yeah, and... I don't and forget what's car. So, yeah, I'd done my first ever rally with Martin. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. He retired not long after that, and then he he married and he moved to Whistler. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he's still he's still in Whistler, so I'll, yeah. I'll drop by his place every once in a while, have a yeah. cup of tea, and just shoot the. Yeah, he still does still does some instructing, doesn't he? At Tuttle's. He does, yeah, lots of driving instructing. He does stunt driving. Uh, he's done all sorts of like kind of commercial like tire and vehicle testing. Like okay. he's still very much uh, immersed in it. And we've I've actually through some of like my uh, film stuff, just like uh, production company, we've hired him as like a stunt driver for, for things in the past. So yeah, it's, it's pretty fun to have him around. Yeah. He's, there's a, going back to British Championship, there's a, a reunion. Donna Kelly, has he, has he been in touch? You no, I was, I was at Donna's museum uh, about six months ago and I was chatting to him after it and he was telling me uh, he's trying to do a reunion of all the Formula Two, Formula Two days of British Championship. So I wasn't in the Formula Two days because I wasn't in the. But you'd still got to come. Yeah, there'd be some proper weekend that. There would be a heavy weekend. I'd say you need to come well prepared. You're allowed to transport yourself to one era in the WRC, one generation of cars. So it could be Group B, Group Four, Group A. What, where, which era, and which car? I feel I keep more familiar than me. I so. keep feeling I'm. I was born in the wrong era. Probably my style and my approach probably suited more the, I would say, 90s, late 90s, mid to late 90s for me when, uh, Colin Stein, when I went from Group A to the World Rally Car scene, that 96, 97, 98, and that transition, that for me was a magical time at WRC. I don't know if it was just my age that I was at. I was a teenager then. Went to watch my first ever World Rally was Rally Catalonia, I think 1997. But for me then, the atmosphere about the rallies was incredible. The championship was on its way up. They got the rules right. There was seven factory teams, 21 factory cars. You know, that's when it was proper. And now it's WRC. Well, we don't want to get into that kind of worms if everyone's discussing the WRC at the moment. But when you have six to seven cars on the start line, and at the end, an R5 car is in the top four or five. Yeah. And I look back then, that was proper back. 21 factory cars, they got the recipe right at that era. You know, and now it needs a refresh, but everyone's fighting over which direction it goes. But no, for me, mid to late 90s. We, we were a little bit down the road from that, but you did get a shot in Rally Island in an Impreza World Rally car. Was that, would that have been your, in those old two litre cars you... You only drove that. I started doing a f- first ever World Rally car I drove was 2007, I believe. Um, I'd done a few rallies in Ireland, the Circuit of Ireland, uh, Killarney. Um, was that a yellow Pirelli car? Yes, I drove the Ulster Rally and the yellow Pirelli car. The rest of them was a Kenny McKinstry S11. So, uh, yeah, but that those cars had advanced so much even from the late 90s cars. Those cars had fully active diffs. Um, they were still nice to drive, but I think I'd have preferred the bit more. The Group A started the World Rally Carrier. They were a lot more manually operated and, you know, a lot less driver aids on them, shall we say, you know. So, uh, yeah, that era I would have loved to have been about. Everyone would have loved to have been about in the Group B era. But uh, for me personally, when the technology started to ramp up and everything started to get better, I preferred that era. You know, I think in the Group B, people remember it because it was five, 600 horsepower, but they had no suspension, no brakes, no steering worth talking about. They probably weren't 
fascinating to drive through an unemployer like a current World Rally car is. So it was point and squirt, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was point and squirt to a certain degree. Yeah, that's too sorry. Yeah. Over to you. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, that's a tough one. I mean, good point. Obviously, both the manufacturers. Like, I don't. I've never got to experience the kind of Group A cars so much. But I would say, like for me, the early two thousand era was was just really spectacular to watch. And there was still like a big manufacturer present at the time, and each manufacturer had you know two three drivers, and it seemed like that's when like things started to become a bit more like serious but like it hadn't reached this point of where everything was like a formula yet like people were still figuring it out and there was lots of things moving within the sport and the cars were advancing but there was no like you know there was so much to learn still even though it looked very proper yeah. but uh, the cars were spectacular to watch there was you know so much action and and the boys were just always sending it like there was just a crazy era yeah i it absolutely it was i think and the thing, you know, everybody becomes, you know, obsessed with Group B because it was so emotive and, you know, there were such tragic times as well as everything else. But both of you would have taken seconds a mile out of those cars. And it, it kind of, I remember having this conversation with you that the speed, this it's the suspension, isn't it, that's changed so much and, and brought the speed up. Suspension and aero and brakes and they can, you can only drive a, a powerful car fast if you have good brakes. They also and the brakes have improved so much and everything's just went uneven. I see it now doing all the development work with Skoda and the R five. Like we, we go to test on stages and for me it's as fast as when I started in the WRC in a in a two thousand and thirteen World Rally car. The speeds of the current R fives are probably similar, if not far away. So yeah, obviously the Rally One carries now have moved on again, but yeah. That's just progression. Technology is always just progresses all the time, you know. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. Uh, so now you've got one gallon of fuel left in the whole wide world. Where are you going to put it? Where are you going to drive? What's that? What's that one special bit of road that I know? Kind of got you only idea. allowed one gallon. <laughs> well, no, all right. I don't gallon. think one gallon would take me through on a boy. Are we in? <laughs> no, it would be on a boy for you though. My last fill of a tank. Yeah. On a boy. What is it? That, I mean, I, I've driven that road a good few times, obviously very slowly. It is, you know, there's some different bits to it, isn't it? You get to the junction and you turn left and it changes there. You've come down the steps and then Cacaristo gets narrow. It, it, it's just the whole thing. Yeah, and it's such an iconic stage. I remember watching it like in the 80s when I was six, seven years of age. I remember watching Group B stuff, doing all the finish stages, but like after you've done world, after you're in the world championship scene for a few years and you've wrecked it a few times you've done it quite a few times everybody knows every inch of every stage but especially on Empire. so to make a difference is there to make a difference in there is always difficult because everyone knows it so well but uh, it's such a special place it's such you have to get your lines millimeter perfect everywhere because you're taking off in sixth gear 190 kph and if you take off Six inches of line, you're landing a meter and a half. Fifty meters up the road, you're landing a meter and a half in the ditch if you don't get your takeoff speed right. You know, so it's threading that eye of a needle at at the speeds you do it. It just makes it so special. Hence, I I probably the the speed I was driving in the rental car, I could never figure out the famous Sordo and Gardemeister Rock on the left. Would that have been a jump way back that they just got wrong? Or how would you get that the one? Stage. You speak. I remember speaking to you. Had the year I won Finland was 2016. He turned up to my test, and I was you had Kankinen, and I was chatting to him, and he said the rallies changed so much because over the years, as it snows in the winter times and the snowplow takes the snow away, it scrapes a little bit off the crest. So back in the days, it used used to be a lot more aggressive on the lips of the jumps, and every year they just get a little bit smoother. So couple that with the suspension technology improving all the time now it's you, yes there's a few jumps in it and you need to be very careful because the car even if it goes light you don't get that feedback off the of steering but um yeah it's probably become less aggressive the road over the years you know but yellow house is still is that flat is that absolutely flat out no you need to well you need to lift and go back on the throttle to get the right trajectory off the jump because if you just go flat out you'll land and do a Richard Burns yeah. and land and he done the oil filter I think on the front yeah. and crush the turbo pipe as well yeah so no you have to do a little dab but it's flat out 
The year, the year I done it the opposite way was more scary. Because it's a drop, it's a drop jump. And you look like you fly straight. And into you're the coming on about a K and a half before it. You're on the rev limiter, so you're coming out of it on the rev limiter as a drop jump into. Uh, yeah. Wow. Anyway, it's good. So your last fill of gas, where are you going with it? Uh, there, there's a stage yeah. in the Canadian Rally Championship. It's, there's, a, there's a rally called Rally Defeat. And there's one stage in there. It's, it's, a, it's a really long stage. It's like 35 kilometers typically. But there's a piece of it, and the, the road's called Elmet. And it's unbelievable. It's similar to what, what Chris is explaining with Finland, but the, the surface is really sandy, and it's like... There's big bushes and you're kind of like you're clipping the bushes and you can jump to the outsides of a lot of things. And, but it's like you never really know how deep you can go into everything. But I had done the rally in a, in a Group N car basically like early on, you know, maybe 2016 or something like that. And then we had gone back and we, we did it. During, we, we tested there the new 23R Subaru. Um, and it was just driving that car on that road was so much fun. Like that was the, that, that's the most fun I've had in a car like to this day and so if we ever got the chance to go back and do that again i would 100%. did you want to go did you ask to test it the was car there? it was my it was my request to go do this these roads not just that road in particular but that, that was one road was like we really wanted like something that was going to test the car like because the road develops a lot it, you know it's sandy and it gets rutted and then the rocks come up and it's there's a lot of jumps and like there's a lot of uh, angle to the car like when you're driving like you're coming over the jumps and the car's always sideways or like you know you're like stuffing it into the ruts and there's a lot of like steering input and so it was just a good place to like really test, test the durability of the car and what what the performance would be like and we went there and it was like it was unbelievable yeah so you need to go to Onampoya and I need to go to Canada <laughs> <laughs> the feeling of the car in the air jumping is that something special or is it heart in the mouth moment well, I had this conversation last week because my my young kid, nine year old girl, she's coming off jumps the height of the ceiling, so with skis on, and I can't, I wouldn't even dare to do it. So when I leave the ground on a set of skis, I feel awkward. When I leave the ground on a bicycle, I feel awkward. When I leave the ground on a car, I feel completely at ease. Really? Yeah. So for me, jumping in a car is no problem, but what these wackos do on a bicycle i can't fathom you know you can yeah. obviously ski yeah i grew up i grew up in whistler so i grew but up skiing you can jump easily on skis yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so i can't do that i'm i'm not comfortable when i leave the ground i don't know what to do but i mean for me like jumping a car and jumping a bike it's like it's the same feeling if i'm going too big then that's the only time i'm like you know have that hard mouth moment but it, normally i'd like it Jumping the cars like it's it feels so chill and it's like the cars are so good now they're like they land and it's smooth and yeah and it's just quiet isn't it in it's there? yeah it's like exactly everything goes like calm for a second yeah. um, but I really like the the it's the like when you're jumping the car but there's like more dynamicness to it. like if you're sideways or there's input or you're landing and you know there's like something like a, a hook to catch or it's like that's when like rally gets so good yeah just a straight flat jump it doesn't do anything it's He's nothing not for me yeah. that exciting you yeah. need uh landing into a corner on how deep you can land you're using corner. the brakes in the air a little or like something you know just to like yeah. place yourself and yeah i know i mean those beaches are the iconic ones on it the sideways over the jump it's yeah it's pretty special well it's it's pretty much time to wrap it up now i've just got one last question to say otago we're we're here we're in dunedin you're probably going to get a bit of a, a pass on this one. You've only been here 48 hours, but tell me, both of you, what's the best thing so far that you've seen of Otago? They do a very good Guinness. And I never drink Guinness outside of Ireland. But I do quite this well one here. was really, really good. So, uh, right. Yeah, the Guinness was good. And it's Guinness. Well, I, I was going to say it's Guinness with a view, but the view in Ireland's always pretty good as well. So, so if you can see the view, if it's not down the rain but yeah we, we might have a bit of an, an issue with the rain here in the next few days but yeah come come to Dunedin for the Guinness or come to Dunedin for uh I mean everyone's been so welcoming so far like we did we did a test today and it got it got pretty busy at one point a lot of people were you know shaking down the cars but everyone was just like so stoked to see like me and and Chris and and want to talk about the cars and and telling us about the road just just giving us some like local knowledge um so obviously can't 
you know, appreciate that enough. Obviously, they welcomed us here and, and found us some cars. So, uh, yeah, just it's it's been great. I'm, I'm hoping to see. I've, I've been to Dedean before, but I'm hoping to see some other parts of it. Um, Recce is going to be a long day, and I'm assuming we'll we'll cover a lot of ground with the way, you know, no repeat stages and things like that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's... I think you need to ask that question again after the weekend. Yes. Yeah, when you've seen a bit of the country. We'll come back to that. But it, it's been a pleasure. It's great to be down here with you boys. And thank you very much for joining us on Spin the Rally Pod. Enjoy it. And we might do some more of these vodcasts uh, or podcasts if you're listening. But, yeah, thank you very much and have a good one. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you.